thank you very much, Professor Poltsov and Professor Sukov, for inviting me uh, here to uh, tell you what we've been doing and uh, for the opportunity to see this uh, wonderful city here that uh, you have, St. Petersburg. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about results because I've been noticing the lack of the clinical focus so far uh, today, and yet the conference is called uh, Molecular Basis of Clinical Medicine. So let's talk a little bit about the clinical um, side of things. Well, um, we started a worldwide collaborative study back in about 2004, and um, by 2008, some of our international collaborators were starting to publish their results. <clears throat> Uh, and at the International Congress on Autoimmunity in uh, Porto, in Portugal, in 2008, uh, Dr. Greg Blaney from Canada reported on a few very interesting case studies. The first one was a patient with progressive multiple sclerosis, uh, an EDSS around eight, uh, and in that case the disease had reversed and the patient uh, was back to about seven and was mo mobile again. Uh, a patient with uh, a diagnosis chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, with also positive ANA, and uh, who was positive for Borrelia, doing well, and a patient with fibromyalgia and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, who was also doing well. But also, the very first of our um, uh, study uh, analyses was done. We did a retrospective on about a hundred or so of the thousand uh, totally enrolled at that particular point. And uh, Captain Tom Perez, uh, recently retired from 25 years at the US FDA, uh, summarized those results. And the interesting thing is that with this particular therapy that these collaborators were using, um, diseases that, uh, or diagnoses ranging from rheumatoid arthritis through Hashimoto's, psoriasis, um, and uh, somewhere in the middle is uh, multiple sclerosis, of course, which you mentioned earlier, right to uh, Mycenae gravis and diabetes insipidus, were all responding in some favorable fashion uh, to the therapy that was being used, an immunostimulative therapy, not immunosuppressive, immunostimulative. Uh, two years later, at the International Congress on Autoimmunity in Ljubljana, um, Dr. Greg Blaney uh, uh, chronicled three cases, ankylosing spondylitis, which responded very quickly, uh, autoimmune arthritis with Raynaud uh, comorbidity, rheumatoid arthritis and aggressive rheumatoid arthritis. The thing that's very interesting in all of these cases is by this time, the endpoint which the clinical collaborators were looking to achieve was return to work, return to the family, return to work. In other words, the disease reversal rather than just disease containment. Um, by last year at uh, the Autoimmunity Congress in Asia, um, Dr. Uh, Goetze Pelka from Berlin um, gave some results of uh, patients uh, with sarcoidosis and multiple sclerosis who had recovered well, uh, but in particular was focusing on the psychiatric comorbidities that had also recovered along with the inflammatory disease, pointing out that the psychiatric disease and neurological disease uh, appeared to be very, very tightly coupled to the underlying infl systemic inflammatory processes. She gave two case histories, once again with the end point of return to work, and uh, just a few weeks ago at the Autoimmunity Congress in Granada, in Spain, um, Inga, no uh, Inga Linzeth from Norway gave a case series uh, demonstrating re resolution of CFSME using this drug that they had been using, Olmosartan, once again with an endpoint of return to work. He had uh, uh, people with uh, two to, I, I recall about two to six years of uh, therapy and around 20 out of uh, 60 were able to return to work. At the start of the uh, study, only two were uh, uh, in, in gainful employment. So it's not all that unusual for such a wide range of diseases, such a wide range of diagnoses to be affected by one therapy. For example, TNF therapy and prednisone, the immunosuppressive therapies, 
uh, have been used for, for decades. But in this case, it was a diametrically opposite uh, therapy that was in use. It's an immunostimulative therapy. So how could this possibly work? At the molecular level, what is happening here? Um, and the clue lies in molecular mimicry. You know, just a decade ago, the human genome was uh, decoded, fully decoded, and there's been a burst of discovery since that time. But, you know, the biggest discoveries are not the ones that you've been reading about in your paper, uh, uh, your newspapers, or even, in fact, uh, hearing about at the major conferences. Because the biggest discovery is the extension of the human genome to the understanding of the microbiota that is Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens is a superorganism. Each one of us is carrying around thousands of species and subspecies of um, other organisms. Uh, it's complex uh, how to describe them. Let me call them other uh, organisms. The human microbiome. Uh, they're in all our tissues, they're in our blood. Any sample of blood from a live human being, run that through a sampler, through a sequencer, or through PCR, you will find the organisms. It's absolutely clear. And um, several years ago, 2007, the uh, National Institutes of Health started the Human Microbiome Project to try and find out exactly where these microbes, uh, uh, what these microbes were doing and where they were in our body. And uh, those of you that read the uh, Los Angeles Times or the New York Times uh, of yesterday would have seen front page stories on the results of the HMP project because it's now finished. Late last year it finished. And the Human Microbiome Project identified millions of genes belonging to thousands of species of microbes which live in and on the human body. 25,000 human genes millions of microbial genes. Over three million was the estimate that was given by NIH yesterday. Plus all the viral genes and, and the fungal genes as well. <clears throat> and in fact, our microbes make us genetically unique. Everybody has a different, slightly different uh, um, family of microbes. Uh, our genes might be fairly similar, um, we may have some SNP differences, I'll talk about them later, but basically our microbes are very different. No matter which part of the body we sample, the microbes in each of us are different. And more importantly, those microbes change from week to week and month to month. Our microbes change. The balance is continuously changing. And at some points in our lifestyle, some of us will get a balance that causes dysfunction of the human genome and we become ill. Metagenomics is a study of those microbes. And the textbook was published last year, Metagenomics of the Human Body. The uh, human body contains an ecosystem of microbes. Um, and uh, we wrote the chapter in there on autoimmunity. Uh, and the, the important thing is to note that subclinical chronic infection is now confirmed, and not just a concept. It's been debated for decades. You know, can microbes persist in the human body. Yes, they do persist. Thousands of species persist. And in fact, babies are born dirty. When you were born, you have a good complement of microbes. I was going to say a healthy complement, not necessarily. Some babies are born ill. But uh, a good, good complement of microbes when you were born. And from that point on, you can't avoid uh, accreting or gathering more microbes as you go through life. Uh, this is data from the Craig Venter Institute, and it shows organisms in air samples, DNA in air. And you can see in an, a hospital, of course, in San Diego Indoor Hospital, or I a hospital indoors, that there is a large percentage of bacterial DNA in the air. That's probably no surprise in a hospital. But you go into a house, and you find about the same percentage that 85% of the air floating around in the house, contain, uh, well, of the DNA in the air floating around the house, is bacterial. And then there's some human content, uh, fungi, insects, rodents, etc. If you take an outdoor sample, then the insects, uh, insects tend to be a very large 
uh, relative proportion. And you can't get avoided in food either. This is a wonderful study that was done at MIT by Eric Alms Group. And what they did was a heat map showing the um, locations on the human body where antimicrobial resistant genes were present, where uh, bacterial genes were present that generally were regarded as conferring antimicrobial resistance. And you can see a mirroring between the uh, human um, genes that were found from the human body and those that were found in food from farm, um, agrarian food, soil, and then it goes quiet from that point on. But there is a huge correlation between the, uh, the bacterial genes that we get from our food and the bacterial genes that collect in our body. And of course, in these last few decades of travel, international travel, to which we're all <laughs> contributing, and the international transport of food, particularly we're eating food in many cases, uh, US food comes from South America and from all over the world. It makes it much easier for the uh, microbes which uh, exist in the human body and indeed in the body of the farm animals to uh, spread. But look, the really important microbes, the ones you read about in the New York Times yesterday, were the microbes that are in our gut. It's really easy to study microbes in our gut and most of the um, uh, m most of the early studies that have been done on the microbiome have focused on the GI tract. But the really important microbes are the ones that manage to get inside the nucleated cells and live within the cells, as the last speaker uh, pointed out. The, the key is to get inside the cells. If you're a pathogen and you can get inside a cell and persist inside a cell, then you can do whatever you like. And um, that's been noticed before. This uh, was a study that was done at Columbia University uh, back some time ago by uh, Wirosko's group. And what they did was stain for nuclear DNA in um, phagocytes, that is, uh, white cells, from um, patients with a number of uh, chronic diseases. And they found in the cytoplasm of these phagocytes there were colonies of microbes, um, of different types of colonies, of course, different types of microbes. So the very phagocytes that were supposed to kill the bacterial pathogens were providing safe harbour for them. And this is a similar um, uh, case. This one is from an infected uh, lymphocyte from a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis patient. You can see some, uh, a cluster of a vacuole uh, which contains infected uh, uh, DNA or infected uh, organisms in a vacuole type environment and also long um, slivers as well. You can see them with an optical microscope. This was um, provided to us by one of our collaborators and this is a, a monocyte which has just uh, exploded as the, um, fa the cytoplasm got uh, too tight um, and these huge long philopedia have been thrown out by the microbes in that um, cytoplasm, in the infected cell. Let's see if I could bring it back again. In the infected cell, the cytoplasm exploded. Nucleus is basically intact. It's a cytoplasm that gets infected. And then these long, thin tubules that uh, uh, contain the uh, microbial DNA uh, attempting to spread from cell to cell. So it was pretty obvious to me about a decade ago that I needed a different type of microscope. With the optical microscope, you could see some things. With the electron microscope, you could see other things. But neither of them allowed you to see the molecules. Neither of them allowed to see what was happening at the level of the molecules. And it's clear, as uh, Professor Paltz have said at the start today, the molecules are where it's all happening. The, molecule, the molecular uh, interactions are key to understanding disease. So uh, what we put together was a computational microscope capable of looking at molecules within the cell uh, and determining how the molecules interact and in fact how they exist at the cell, inside the cell. We're not the only people doing this, there are other in the world that have done it, but we did it a little bit differently and, and we achieved some results. Um, and of course the microscope is made of chemistry, physics and math. You basically 
emulating at any point where each uh, atom in, in the molecule is. And, uh, and of course, supercomputers. A lot of computing power. And that allowed us to do things like this. What I've done here is I've got the human angiotensin 2 receptor. The angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor. Uh, it's got a drug in the binding pocket, the drug olmosartan that we spoke about earlier, in the binding pocket. And over here I have the protein YDGG from the E. coli genome. This is an E. coli receptor, transmembrane receptor. I don't know what E. coli uses it for. Maybe it's in a molecular mimic. But anyway, if you look at the two receptors, you'll find the molecular structure is essentially identical. The molecular structure of the um, protein, folded protein from uh, the E. coli bacterium and the human angiotensin II receptors are essentially identical. When these are mixed in the cytoplasm, it will cause all, all sorts of problems for the Golgi mechanisms and the other mechanisms that drive human metabolism. And it's interesting, the main difference is there is some difference in the um, specific amino acids and the olmosartan drug docks in a slightly different position inside the uh, receptor. Well, wait a minute, the drug docks inside a bacterial protein? Our drugs, the drugs we're taking, directly affect bacteria? That's an interesting observation in and of itself. <clears throat> But you know, bacteria also have metal metabolisms that are very similar to man. Now, the eukaryotes are special, but even the prokaryotes are somewhat similar because there is an evolution process that are linking them together. And if we take uh, microbial metabolism and look in particular at the glucose metabolism, we find that E. coli gets its energy from glucose 6-phosphate, and it uh, generates pyruvate uh, at the bottom. But each of these uh, arrows, seven arrows if I remember, um, are specific intermediates in the glucose cycle for E. coli that are identical with the substrate metabolites in man. In other words, there are genes, which are listed here, there are genes in the E. coli genome that are identical in function, but slightly different in molecular composition, but identical in function to those that are man, that, that are in man, in Homo sapiens genome. Very, very similar, but slight differences. We've been hearing that so much from um, the laboratory people saying, look, we're seeing dysfunction, we're seeing SNPs, we're seeing longer substitutions. Maybe we're seeing the bacteria. So in this particular case, molecular mimicry is not any specific attempt by the microbe to mimic a function. It's the microbe needs to live. It's got to, <laughs> to uh, turn glucose into energy, and it does it the same way that we do it. <clears throat> but you know, um, two speakers ago, um, we heard that the mouse is not a very good model. We now have a complete genome of the mouse, and in fact it is amazing how different the, 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 the mouse is to man in terms of the way it actually works. So what we were able to tell from our molecular microscope working with Homo sapiens uh, genes was that in Homo sapiens, and only Homo sapiens, not in the mice, not even in the higher pro primates, there is a key uh, immune function that is weak. In Homo sapiens there is one nuclear receptor which expresses the genes for a key um, toll-like receptor, toll-like receptor 2, as well as cathelicidin and beta defense and antimicrobial peptides. And all of those of course are essential to intracellular innate immune defenses. So in order to survive within cells, microbes clearly need to evolve to knock out that receptor. And that's exactly what they do. The microbes that uh, are specialised to knock out that receptor are the typical ones that you've seen in chronic disease. 
EBV is, uh, knocks it out up to a factor of 15 times in a lymphoblastoid cell line at one and a half years, but also Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Borrelia burgdorferi, Chlamydia trachomatis, Aspergillus, HCV and CMV all specifically manage to suppress the innate immune system and survive by knocking down expression of and by the VDR, nuclear receptor. But you know, the microbiome also messes with our human biology. They not only knock down the VDR, which definitely affects our human biology. VDR is a very important receptor. Um, but they knock it down in, in millions, an imponderable quantity of other, other ways as well. Um, and for example, a dysfunction, F, uh, a dysfunction X, which may be a disease symptom, uh, can come with the uh, genes from bug A combining with genes from bug B and uh, causing a dysfunction uh, X. And also you can have multiple bugs with one bug uh, or one microbe um, uh, missing. For example, some microbes are uh, antagonistic to each other. Strep and staph uh, seem to get at each other's throats all the time. So you have both combinations of uh, of microbial components that will cause a human dysfunction and then you also have missing components as well. And the genomes of the microbes grad accumulate gradually during life. It's genes from the accumulated metagenome at any point in life which determine the clinical dysfunction and the disease symptoms. And that's why you see the, the comorbidities. When I was first studying diabetes uh, 1978, many years ago, one of the things I noticed was that the patients that we were treating for diabetes also tended to have asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension, a number of comorbidities. And this particular chart uh, came from uh, Dr. Prohl's um, paper in uh, Metagenomics of the... actually came from our chapter in the book. My, my colleague, Dr. Prohl. Um, but that was obtained from uh, some studies that were done in, uh, on comorbidity that are published in PubMed. Very interesting, the links between all these diagnoses. We like to think of disease as separate, but we can't. Now, something else we were able to do with our uh, molecular microscope is see how the molecules interact. And this is actually the VDR receptor. And across this region, the receptor is the coactivator, which needs to be bound in order to produce the uh, uh, heterodimer and uh, translate genes. And we were able to show with the drug that we were using in the human uh, receptor that the uh, active atoms here were ready to bind to the coactivator. And we were also able to show that in the rat, that was not the case. In the rat, the drug does not work. What happens is this. You've got the VDR nuclear receptor, which is very important. It transcribes at least a thousand genes. Probably as much as a quarter of the total genome is affected. Expression is affected by VDR. Um, and normally there is a steroid calci calcitriol that activates the VDR. But when the microbes come along, the microbes have toxins, for example, gliotoxin, uh, is one of the toxins, many ways that they can knock out the uh, functions of the VDR. The microbes knock out the activation of the VDR and that stops the VDR from producing the antimicrobials that would otherwise uh, kill the intracellular microbes. And this drug that we found, Olmosartan, is capable of reactivating the VDR provided the dosing is changed. You see a normal dosing of Olmosartan is a single peak and then it trails away through the rest of the day. When we retarget the drug for multiple dosing during the day, you can see we keep a basal level in the uh, bloodstream and that allows the drug to have totally different effects from when it's given as a blood pressure drug because it was developed as a blood pressure drug. Because we had a drug that's already approved by the FDA that could be prescribed with different uh, dosing off-label, we were able to go straight to patient important outcomes. We didn't, weren't distracted by worrying about the mouse and how the mouse behaved and the differences between mouse and man. We were able to go straight to the patient important outcomes with our clinical collaborators. And what we found was this, that in order to help people with chronic disease, wide, huge wide range of chronic disease, about 120 diagnoses in our cohort, 
you have to not only deal with the inflammation, you have to also deal with the molecular mimicry. The inflammation gives rise to cytokine storm, autoantibodies, nitric, uh, nitric oxide, uh, ROS, urea, etc. But then the molecular mimicry provides the dysfunction, the interactome damage, which leads to the body dysfunction, the cortisol dysfunction, the thyroid dysfunction. You have to deal with both of those. Just attacking the inflammation does not prevent the uh, spread of the disease, nor does it exacerbate all of the disease symptoms. In, in a way, you can think of these persistent intraphagocytic infections, the intra intracellular infections, uh, as something like white ants. You know, with white ants in a building, there's no obvious sign of damage until the whole structure starts to crumble. And that's the stage we are at the moment in medicine. And we've got to move towards a stage of predictive medicine where we can say, look, there seem to be white ants in this structure. The microbiome gives us the, bene uh, gives us the ability to do that. Of course, there's always a problem. And in this case, the problem is immunopathology, which means that when the immune system starts recognizing the microbes within the cells and killing the microbes within the cells, Many of the cells die as well. Uh, plus the immune system is more active, you have a, a, a surge in the cytokine storm, you have a surge in the uh, immune functions, and that is what is termed immunopathology. So the pathogen is exerting direct damage uh, onto the host. The host resistant mechanisms exert um, damage back onto the pathogen. But there is some of this damage caused by the immune response that gets back and hurts the host a bit too. And this is immune pathology. We covered it in detail in our paper, a recent paper there. I won't uh, spend any more time because we're tight on time on that, and, uh, but immunopathology has to be dealt with and it has taken us a decade to figure out how to manage immunopathology in order to induce recovery. So predictive and preventative medicine. Now that we have a working model of, for autoimmune disease processes, it becomes practical and sensible to start treating patients early. For example, as soon as, they, as we see autoantibodies, typically uh, with the new tests that are available, autoantibodies can be found years before any symptomatic uh, dysfunction occurs in an individual. Uh, most of us are carrying around autoantibodies. The Red Cross blood, blood supply has autoantibodies in it. So um, we, when, we, when people first start to exhibit with autoantibodies, maybe that's the point at which we need to say, look, you shouldn't have those. There's a dysfunction. Let's start looking at your immune system. Measure the markers of the immune system. The VDR uh, effectiveness is one of the markers we can use. There are some um, CYP24, um, uh, for example, which is characteristic of VDR that uh, has been measured clinically as, uh, as a VDR indicator. But at that point, um, we can initiate therapy because Olmosartan, the drug that uh, overcomes the effects of the uh, microbes, is one of the safest drugs in the US formally. I hate saying a drug is safe, especially when I'm espousing its use. <laughs> However, um, it is a very, very safe drug. The FDA has set no unsafe dosage for this drug. There's no known unsafe dosage for it. And it's FDA approved to be taken for a lifelong, lifelong dysfunction, which is uh, um, high blood pressure. Our off-label retargeting does change the safety profile a little because of immunopathology, but the earlier that a patient begins therapy, the less is the amount of immunopathology they exhibit. In fact, healthy people exhibit no immunopathology at all. And that's very important because the drug would never have been approved if the cohort were exhibiting immunopathology at the same time as a lowered blood pressure. So the earlier we get the patients, the much easier it is to stop the disease progressing in the long term. So maybe we have an opportunity here uh, for predictive and preventive medicine. Now I want to talk something else as well. There's a huge impact of the microbiome on the work that each one of us does. Because when you take a sample from a human being, whether it be blood or whether it be tissue or whether it be cells, that sample contains microbes. It contains microbial DNA which you can find with PCR 
and it contains uh, or, or with uh, uh, a sequencing approach. And you have to be very careful when you're doing a study of SNPs or mutations that the DNA that you're actually looking at is human DNA, that all of the microbial DNA has been stripped out. And this was realised some time ago by the US government, of course, after the anthrax attacks in, in uh, America. And they put a lot of money into uh, searching through DNA data databases to find which are the microbial genes and which are the human genes. And if you look at that particular um, URL from Argonne National Labs, you'll find that any uh, studies that you've done of human body where you haven't sorted out the microbes, um, they will help you do it either by providing the software or providing the computing power. Um, there are a number of other very important um, papers here that I've listed for those of you that are doing genetic testing and genetic analysis to help you better analyse your sample and make sure that what you are thinking is a SNP is actually a SNP and not just a piece of microbial receptor that looks awfully the same as the human receptor. Because what happens is the software that has been provided you for your genome sequencing is very faulty. It only needs one or two uh, base pair errors and it goes totally wrong as it forces the RNA up into the human genome that it has in its data bank. Because when you feed in an RNA sample into one of the sequencing machines, it's trying to put that RNA up into the human genome that it has remembered in its memory, uh, that the standardised human genomes we've had for a decade. And as we can see from these um, uh, graphs here, which came from uh, actually Barry Merriman's uh, paper, uh, he checked uh, for six of the major pieces of software that are used by all the commercial manufacturers and he found that just one, uh, a one position deletion was enough to cause um, 10, 15 percent uh, errors in the mapped reads. And the same with an insertion, just a one position insertion was in some of the software enough to cause more than 10 percent uh, poor assembly of that uh, RNA. It's very, very important. We have to remember that every sample you're working from with a human being has got microbes in it. And if you look at the DNA and the RNA, you'll find them. So here we are, take-home points. There's a lot of them, I'm sorry. Uh, first take-home point is um, Homo sapiens is a superorganism. Uh, it's a symbiotic metagenome. When the metagenome becomes unbalanced, then disease ensues. Intrafagocytic microbiota persist by suppressing innate immunity, innate immunity, knocking down the VDR nuclear receptor. And all the antibodies that we see, the autoantibodies that we see, are of course a cascade. Once the innate immune system is uh, compromised, then the cytokine um, release causes the adaptive immune system to say, wow, we better start working extra hard and try and deal with this uh, problem that the innate immunity has. So it's the innate immune system that's key. Uh, Olmosartan can reactivate the VDR and reactivate immune function if it's used properly. But you have to be very careful because many people will get very, very ill. Nothing like having a, a call from a, 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 a hospital that uh, uh, it was in the middle of the night, I think about 10 years ago, and um, one of the uh, subjects had a... Um, heart rate of 10 with occasionally missing beats. You don't want that sort of thing. That is too much immunopathology. You have to control the immunopathology. Um, and, and the temporary worsening of disease is measurable. Usually the patients feel better right away, but you can measure the temporary working, uh, worsening of disease. Read our paper for that before the healing becomes dominant. And before commencing a genetic study, always remove the microbial RNA. And for those of you that have already done a study, you can take your raw data and feed it back through Argonne Labs and they will take the microbial RNA out of that for you. So you'll have a cleaner sample to look at again. Um, disease is complex and not simple. It's pretty obvious, I think just about everyone has said that here. But the reason for that is because the interactome, 
the n potential for interactions between the millions of microbial genes and the 25,000 human genes is semi-infinite. Uh, <laughs> semi-infinite is really the only way that we can quantify it at, at this point. So thank you very much, Mr Chairman, and uh, once again, thanks to the organising committee.